So in part two here, folks, we'll talk all about the chronology of the uh, first uh, um, uh, first tribes or uh, Native American tribes around the uh, um, Great Lakes region, right? So here's a chronology. This is developed after uh, Levis in 2009, right? 11,000 to around 10,000 Paleo-Indian uh, colonies. These are our first evidence of colonists. This probably goes back a little farther, right? But 10,000 to about 2,500 years before present, which is 8,000 BC to, or 8,000 to 5,000 or 550 BC, sorry about that. Um, we have the archaic uh, culture, right? And we have the early, the middle, and then the late archaic culture, right? From oldest to youngest. After that, we have the woodlands culture. We have again, early, middle, and late woodlands culture. This goes to about 1200 AD. And then after that, uh, from 1200 to 1640, which is uh, contact with European civilizations, we have the either the late woodland or also what's known as the upper Mississippian. Right? Uh, Mississippian not being the Mississippian geologic time period, but this time the Mississippian culture, Native American culture. Right? And around AD 1640, uh, you know, that's when we kind of have our first European contact here in the Great Lakes later, earlier in, you know, one region to another, but kind of AD 1640 is our first European contact. Right? So showing you kind of a, a, a history here, uh, everything is glaciated, you know, till about 11,000 years before present, right? Uh, and then, you know, we start to get evidence of some of our first um, uh, uh, Native American uh, cultures in the Great Lakes region, right? Paleo-Indian cultures, right? Uh, this is the first time we see kind of the Paleo-Indian cultures um, uh, uh, in the Great Lakes, right? Um, and that was about, so here I should mention that this is BC and BP. The difference is BP is before present, present defined as 1950. So they're 1,950 years off of each other. Um, Anyway, so from about 12,000 years ago, it's the earliest we see these Paleo-Indians uh, in Michigan. And this is during the Lake Algonquin phase, a kind of higher phase, right? Uh, in the Archaic, right, we see from about 10,000 years before present, we start to see these Archaic cultures coming in. And we start to see evidence of regional exchange, right? And this is when we go between the... Uh, the Chippewa Stanley phase, right, initiated, right? And then at the end, in the late archaic, we have the Nipissing phase, right? 5,000 years or so before present, right? And then here we have our woodlands. Again, we have early, middle, and late woodlands, right? Making more complex socialized systems, complex burial mounds. There are burial mounds, woodland burial mounds you can find around here. Um, and then again, we have this uh, post Lake Algoma stage, which is again kind of around where we are today. Um, and then we get the upper Mississippian late woodland cultures uh, in southwest Michigan, right? And then eventually European contact. So we go Paleo Indian, Archaic, Woodland, Mississippian, and then European contact. So, how did folks first get here? Well, there's a few different thoughts three different main uh, main thoughts. First of all, an ice-free corridor that existed between our Laurentide ice sheet here and an ice sheet out west called the Cordilleran ice sheet. This would have opened up and possibly or theoretically allowed travel through this following, you know, games such as caribou and elk. Another theory is the maritime theory, the Pacific Rim theory, coming from the same direction, but this time island hopping and sticking around the coast, right? Now, as we notice, see this kind of dark shaded area here? This is the land that would have been exposed during this time, the land that would have been exposed. You notice our sea levels were a lot lower. So uh, the evidence for these uh, uh, time periods of this maritime passage will be currently under sea level, underwater, right? Kind of like those... Uh, uh, archaic ones are going to be underwater in our like Chippewa stage phase here, that low stage, right? And then there's another maritime hypothesis called the Soul Train hypothesis. We can just call this the crazy hypothesis that people came, uh, uh, you know, 
15,000 to 12,000 years ago via boats from Europe, and there's not really a lot of evidence that supports that. Most of the genetics have very close ties to um, to uh, Siberian and 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 those kind of cultures, uh, genetic ties rather than European ties. Right. So these are the two we kind of are are working with here. Right. So. When did this migration first happen into, well, just let's say the whole North American continent? Conventional wisdom says this happened around 12,000 years ago. Right? However, there is some contradictory evidence, uh, some of the oldest being down in Chile, which may be up to 20,000 years old, Meadowcraft Rock, Metal Craft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania, Topper in South Carolina, Cactus Hills, and a few others. Right. So when did people really get here? Well, this is still a... Uh, a hot topic in archaeology. People believe that this was the earliest. They're called Clovis first. Those earliest cultures are called a Clovis culture, but certainly before 12,000 years ago, uh, probably not as early as 30,000 years ago, though. So probably before 12,000 as well. So there are many ions of evidence uh, that do support that earlier date, right? Um, so much of the area was still covered. You know, the ice was melting back. We did have some lakes, but until about 13,000 years ago. Um, but much of the upper lakes uh, were not hospitable until around 12,000 years ago. Right? Um, there are some areas in Wisconsin, um, Schaefer and Hybor, uh, and some mammoth sites with cut marks that date on the mammoth bone placed them at 12,500 years before present. Uh, and that would be the earliest, uh, and this is in southeast Wisconsin, the earliest evidence around their Great Lakes, uh, but it is still somewhat contested. Right? Some issues with dating these remains. First of all, there are a few absolute dates, radiocarbon or otherwise, from around the Great Lakes. Uh, and we have to date then by type or by typology, which is a set of artifacts that links itself to a certain time period. Right. Uh, and this can be challenging because the stuff we find here, the tools and the artifacts we find here, are a regional variant of some of the other ones that we see. Right? Um, some geological uh, deposits issues could be that sites could not be occupied before their formation, right? Beach Ridge and Moraine, but it still could be substantially younger. Right? Uh, and then chert material, the source of chert, right? Some sources uh, have now been inundated by these high lake levels, but we can trace church sources back to certain cultures, and we can kind of divide up these, these areas or cultures by their church sources. Right? And there's also a problem with dating these geological events because we don't have, you know, great carbon dates for everything, right? Showing you around Michigan here, there's just a few of these little sites around here, right? Um, these are Paleo-Indian sites. There's been little systematic survey for them. Uh, it's been better in in Wisconsin, so they have a little bit better record over there. But in Michigan, we have the Ganey site, the Leavitt site, the Barnes Home Beach, and a few others, the Hilo site, which is a late Paleo-Indian, early archaic site uh, in Michigan as well. Right? So we do have a few of these older sites here in Michigan as well. Uh, up in Ontario, they have Park Hill, Thedford, and Crowfield, also more um, late Paleo-Indian, early archaic sites. Right? So looking around here, right? See these Paleo Indian sites very highly correlate to um, the uh, the beach times at the or the the locations of the beach at those different times, right? So as you can see here, this is Lake Ontario, right? Right. This is the Indian River in here. You can see that we do have serpent mounds around there created by these Native Americans, right? So looking at chronology and typology, right? These variations within these different styles of, of technology uh, and the association of them together is what we call typology. These forms, just like, you know, critters change over time, these forms change or evolve over time, right? And they evolve and develop one, uh, uh, one um, chronology uh, for the Great Lakes. The earliest, right, uh, is related to Clovis, it's called Interline, uh, which Clovis is out west, it's a Clovis culture. Uh, that's the Clovis first. And this is, again, about 11,200 years ago before present, right? Um, there's a similar to a Shoop site assemblage. I'm not sure where a Shoop site assemblage in Pennsylvania. 
Um, and that also dates to around 11,200 years ago. Right? So we also have the Ghini culture, which is uh, 11,000 to about 10,400 years ago. This is relatively well documented in Michigan. Uh, and again, is defined by using this, this Mercer chert, right? So using a source of chert to define a culture, right? We then have Park Hill points, it's about 10,005 to about 10,400 years ago. Bay Point chert, uh, this quarry is then used, right? Uh, the habitat there would have been boreal forest subarctic at the time, right? Um, this tool culture is more diverse, has unifacial stone tools, scrapers, a little bit wider, tool sack variety, right? Uh, Crowfield in, in Ontario, possibly in Michigan as well, possible cremation sites associated with these, right? The Holcomb culture complex, this is using again, that Bayport chert, uh, and it is around Beach Ridge in uh, Macomb County, right? Here are some of those, those technologies. So here's a Ganey point, right? A Barnes point, a Holcomb point, and then one we didn't talk about, the Agate Basin point. And then these are all Crowfield points, right? all fairly old point technologies. They then developed, you know, not just arrowheads, but they have, you know, whole toolkits with projectile points, scrapers for scraping meat off bone, gravers, notched tools for sewing, uh, and other uh, facial knives, shredders, um, and optimistic flake tools, which means you break a flake off, may not bend what you intended it for, but you can use it for something else. Right? Here's some late Paleo-Indian points found in, in West Michigan. Beautiful points there. Right? Some of the Paleo-Indian adaptations, there's very little direct evidence of their adaptation uh, to do some environmental reconstruction, right? Uh, Gainly, we're talking a, a spruce parkland type environment. The Park Hill complex, we're talking a, a boreal forest type environment. Right. The habitat probably opens spruce parkland in much of the lower portions of the lake. Right. Uh, likely mostly hunted were caribou, beaver, other mammals. Right. Um, there's some direct evidence uh, of residual blood on tools still after thousands of years. Uh, and that would be cervid, which is going to be our um, our um, our deers. And then Holcomb Beach caribou bones were found at that location as well, right? So we do have a few of those here. We talked about the Heisler, the Pleasant Lake. We talked about Haydn, uh, Shabur. But most of our Paleo-Indian stuff is is out west, right? Um, most of it is out west, including, let's see if they put it on here. They should have put it on here. Well, in New Mexico would have been the, uh, the uh, Clovis site from Clovis, New Mexico. But uh, they did not put that on here. That gives Clovis culture its name, right? What was their social organization like? Like we were talking small bands of 30 to 50 people uh, with weak bordered territories, again, defined by the location of the church source that the individual groups used, right? Uh, these are gonna be fairly analogous to groups that we saw in the Arctic before the 1900s and the introduction of guns and fur trade, right? Um, and uh, so uh, an ethnographic analogy might be the Illamont uh, caribou Eskimo as an analogy for what kind of these paleo Indian hunters were like. Hunting strategies, spear points, right? Possibly drives, driving animals off a cliff or into a, an, a, a, an area where they can be killed, all right? So here's the, the caribou culture that they were talking about and likely what you know early um, Native American cultures were like uh, in the Great Lakes, right? And this showing you kind of Lake Huron here. I'm not sure why she included this slide, so I'm gonna move past it. Oh, I am actually. So, cause here we have the uh, the Albany Amberley Ridge, Alpena Amberley Ridge, which is a ridge that runs right down the middle of Lake Huron. And of course, at the time when these, you know, Paleo Indian and Archaic uh, were here, that was the Chippewa Low Stand. This would have been a low stand here. And this Alpena Ridge would have been uh, 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 above water. And there's evidence on here. You see these stones put down here uh, on the Alpena Ridge. This is now underwater, right? And if we look at these uh, Canadian Arctic caribou drives, right, these stones, they're used as kind of fences to, you know, herd and drive the caribou. Uh, and then there were also lots of stone artifacts now found from this. So this was uh, apparently used uh, by Paleo-Indians as a, a hunting site, right? 
So those first residents, again, in West Michigan, probably not before 11,000, 1,200 years ago, maybe a little earlier, right? Uh, but until about 10,000 years before present, you know, we were talking these, um, these Paleo-Indian uh, uh, with these fluted points, which are very highly related to Clovis culture, this flute being this kind of notch in here, notch there, a notch there. Right? So looking at the archaic culture now, right? Not much are excavated in West Michigan. States are probably still buried. Um, but uh, this, we see a lot more axes and ground, you know, and, and ground stone tools uh, with various styles of projectile points. We can see these projectile points much different now than this style of projectile point. Right? These are more, you know, archaic or Paleo Indian. These are archaic, right? Much more notching going on. Right, to attach the sticks. And we also see the evidence of the first use in mining of copper from the UP during this archaic period. Right? During woodlands times, this is the time of pottery and burial mounds. Those burial mounds around here are mostly woodland burial mound. Um, the early uh, uh, woodlands, 800 BC right, to 100 BC, we're talking Spoonville. And then here in Kent County, Norton and Converse, two more sites. Right? Middle Archaic, we're talking uh, 100 BC to you know, somewhere around 400 AD. Um, again, at the Spoonville site, right? We can see that I'm at the, again at the Norton site, Converse site, Present Farm, right? And then we have our woodland sites, right? Many late woodland sites, Spoonville. Whoops, did I say these are our well, so these are woodland, yes. So mid woodland, sorry, not mid archaic, mid woodland sites, right? And then Late woodland sites are the earliest of the sites. Again, we see Spoonville on here, right? So we're seeing these stack up on top of each other, these cultural complexes, these associations of tools preceding each other in time, right? And then we have late woodlands, early, middle, and late late woodlands, also called in time called late prehistoric, right? That's from 400 to 1640 uh, BC, right? When we have European contact, right? 1640. Yeah, give or take a few years in, in the, you know, where you're talking about within the Great Lakes. Um, but, you know, the sites have been found that have been older than 1640 with European material in them. However, that is likely cultural material going ahead of the actual culture itself. So uh, likely Native Americans were trading these these uh, European culture within themselves long before Europeans act or before Europeans actually showed up, not long before, right? And then some of our earliest uh, uh, histories is, is the fur trade, right? French, British, and American fur trade, right? And then we have uh, industrial activity. Our first, you know, one of our big things here in Michigan especially was logging, right? Uh, we logged pretty much the entire state, right? So looking at this in the 16th century, right? So we have uh, Europeans begin to search for a passage to the Orient through the Great Lakes, right? I should say a 17th century, they have uh, estimated the Native American population around the Great Lakes to be somewhere between 60 and 117,000 uh, when contact was made in the mid-1600s, right? They also noted the Native people occupied widely scattered villages, grew corn, beans, squash, and then tobacco, of course, right? Uh, they moved her once or twice in the generation when they kind of resor uh, exhausted resources in the area, um, but they were, you know, fairly sedentary, mostly farming that point. Here's the first map made of the Great Lakes um, that shows them very accurately. This is a 1688 map by uh, Cornelli um, uh, showing the Great Lakes region. Right. So the very first right of these these trades 1630 to or, you know 1640 to 1763 the fur trade was the big part right for a century and a half Michigan uh, our, our, our economy was based on fur trade, right? Sault Ste. Marie, Mackinac, Detroit, St. Joseph, and the Grand River Valleys were major markets and major centers of, of trade, right? French made alliances with the First Nation peoples who, became, who of course, had the, the skills and the knowledge to hunt and trap at these commercial levels, right? And, of course, this is all because in Europe, beaver was a very highly prized fur, right? You wanted rich and famous, wanted to wear beaver. 100,000 pelts being shipped to Europe each year, uh, the beaver almost became extinct. This is because, uh, uh, thankfully, 
However, fashion trends, I got to thank fashion for the existence of the beaver, uh, it changed in Europe and then the silk hat was becoming more fashionable than the demand for, for beaver pelts. Thus, we still have our beavers, right? And then uh, somewhere in the 1830s, Michigan fever hit, right? So uh, the idea here, quarter sections of plenty were being taken up by the early 1830s when Michigan fever officially began. And with it brought a sudden boom in Michigan's population, right? Quarter sections are, are, are um, land section measurements and they're still actually used today. It's called the public land survey system. Quarter section is a quarter mile by a quarter mile. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, no, a quarter section is a half mile, mile by a half mile. Um, and they were being given away essentially to Europeans to come in and, and settle the events, right? Uh, some things helped uh, to, to aid this. The completion of the Erie Canal opened an easier new route to, to the Great Lakes and for shipping, right, in and out, right? Uh, by 1833, federal Indian policies had removed most Native Americans to the west of the Mississippi, which paved the way for cultural or for government land surveys and increased agricultural development, right? So that may be a very good thing. And then we entered the lumbering era, right? The earliest lumbering Michigan was done by the French in order to build forts, but the British and then later the Americans used Michigan's hard work to build merchant and warships. Uh, about 1855, white pine became the most desired tree species by the lumber industry in the Great Lakes. And uh, it also happened to be that, you know, navigable rivers, extensive forests uh, formed the basis of this, this, uh, um, uh, pine uh, foresting industry here in Michigan. It's all about 1895 when there was a, a recession, which stopped a lot of the logging activity around here. Uh, but most of it uh, is gone. About the only place you can see, at least in lower Michigan, any um, old wood or original uh, uh, hard stands is in Hartwick Pines State Park, somewhere in the middle of the forest here, or middle of the state here, right? Um, but you can see these things were massive, right? And then Here's a, the remains of a white pine stump, which you can still see today, right? And initially, of course, you know, this uh, was a local endeavor to supply local um, supplies, but as shipping started to occur and to, to expand on the Great Lakes, this ex soon made new markets available and opened this up to, you know, kind of trade all the way through the Midwest, right? Um, so when the September from the original forest was gone, like I said, essentially it was all gone. There's only a few acres left uh, in Hartwick Pines State Park of this old growth uh, forest. And that happens to be because they were harvesting it. They had a small patch left, but that's when the depression hit. They shut down. When they reopened 10, 15 years later, they decided there wasn't enough left there to, to bother with, so they left it. So we have this couple acres of, of, uh, of uh, old wood forest just by happenstance, right? So in the early 20th century, right, we start to see the uh, onset of national and state forests to protect some of this land, right? The onset of industrialized agriculture in the Great Lakes and the onset of the automotive industry. And this kind of brings us up to present day. All right, folks, hopefully you enjoyed that. Have a great